Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ episode 80, the Knife series, where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, amongst several topics we're gonna to be discussing, we're gonna be talking about saber grinds, flat grinds, scandy grinds, the difference between them. We're gonna talk about serrations. Are they all they cracked up to be or should you leave them in the dust? Let's check them out. All right, folks, if you're new to this series, the deal is you all leave your questions in the comments section below. I go through them, pick out a few that I think sound interesting to talk about, and we'll pull them out for a future episode. So that's what you got to do if you want a chance to be featured in the future. First question today comes from Ni Mo. When does a Scandi grind become a saber grind, become a full flat grind? Question mark. All right, let's dive right into this because there can actually be, and, and it's no fault of anyone's out there who, who thinks, of these, thinks of these things certain ways, but there's a lot of confusion sometimes about saber grinds and flat grinds, less so between uh, Scandi and those, uh, those other two grinds, but we'll get into all of that. We're gonna start with Scandi. We'll get that out of the way right up front. Um, and when we talk about flat grinds, technically saber grinds are flat. These, these ground portions should be a flat bevel. However, a Scandi is different from a knife with a grind and a secondary bevel, like you would see kind of more typically on a folder. You don't often see Scandies on folders like this Topps Mini Scandi Flipper right here. But the edge on a true Scandi comes right down to essentially, I, I would say it comes down to zero. There's no secondary bevel along the edge. With some exceptions, on, on some manufacturers will go in and put just a micro bevel or at least a little micro convex on the edge to make things a little tougher because Scandi grinds can be a little bit more brittle when they come right down to zero with a you know 11 or 12 degree angle, which is kind of typical of most Scandies, but not all. Um, really great at working with wood. I always like to refer to this as kind of like a double planed chisel. Works fantastically on that stuff especially, which is why bushcraft users appreciate it a lot. The confusion as to where, when does a Scandi become a saber? Again, we're talking technically some different terminologies here. The, the a saber grind doesn't actually refer to the geometry of the grind itself. You could have a saber grind that is flat, you could have a saber grind that is hollow. You could even have, as is the case on this actual saber, where the terminology comes from, a convex grind. And really, what a saber grind refers to, again, it's not the shape, it's more about the height of the grind along the side up the blade. Typically, it's somewhere around halfway up the blade. You can see it here on this, uh, this cold steel saber. What's the name of this model? The French officer's saber. Really impressive thing. Convex ground, not quite halfway up uh, the height of the blade, but you get the picture anyway. I think a perfect example of a saber grind nowadays that's very common on the market is something like the SE5. Here you have a flat saber grind. That grind is halfway up the height of the blade. And that's why when I use the term saber grind on this channel, I always will have flat or hollow or something in there to describe what the edge is actually doing because Saber only describes really the height. Now, some companies will use the term Saber grind no matter where the, uh, the height or, or, or where the top of the grind line is, uh, which is why sometimes you'll hear me say something like a high Saber grind if it's t higher up. But typically in that sort of case, I'll actually, I'll, I'll try to refer to something more as like a high flat grind or a high hollow grind, like on this Civivi Conspirator right here. You can see the top of the grind line poking out in front of that fuller right there. And full flat grind, as you see on the spider coat stretch 2XL, literally is a flat grind, the full height of the blade. You can also have full hollow grinds. Um, that's really what it comes down to. You can say saber grind, but it, it doesn't describe the actual shape of the edge and what the cutting geometry is gonna be like, at least not wholly, without adding things like flat, hollow, or convex, along with that saber descriptor. So, hope those points help you out, sir. 
All right, next question comes from Kanukaru. Are blade serrations really any more effective on certain materials, as some claim, than a properly, quote unquote, sharpened plane edge? My personal ex experience is that serrations saw through stuff long after the plane edge of a knife is dull, and that gives people who can't or don't maintain a proper edge the impression that the serrations cut some materials better. I maintain that an appropriately sharpened edge cuts as well or better than one with serrations. Care to weigh in on this? Sure thing. Will he ever. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong, but it's only part of the picture. A lot of times, yeah, a, a properly maintained plane edge is gonna be just as good as a serrated edge, but only on certain things. There are certain areas where serrations absolutely will hold an advantage. And I'm not necessarily talking about the longevity of the edge, but the actual cutting interface itself between the blade and the medium. For instance, like thick, slick, sisal rope, that sort of thing, like the real, or, or thick manila, not manila, what's the... Really thick rope can actually pose a bit of a problem to a, a finely sharpened plain edge, especially if you go with like a mirror polish. Push cuts will work better for something like that, but if you're actually drawing along a, a slicing motion, the serrations are going to grab into that material better and actually give more edge a chance to cut through that material at a given time. Can be uh, the same type of thing with like anything where an edge might slip as well, such as like hard rubber, that sort of thing. Absolutely is a use case scenario for something like this. Will a plain edge get the job done? Yeah, most of the time. But to simply say there's there's no time when a serrated edge would be better for a given task, which you didn't quite say it in those words, but that's kind of the uh, the, the gist you were going for, at least it feels like that uh, as I read your question. Right tool for the job, and sometimes serrations are absolutely what should be called for. Now, when it comes to the subject of maintaining a serrated edge, they definitely are going to uh, going to require more care. And a serrated edge will dull out eventually, but it is gonna cut more aggressively as it dulls than a plain edge knife. You can get uh, rods sized to essentially these, uh, these particular serration patterns. There's even some, uh, some products out there that are specifically designed for specific companies serration patterns. But if you're going for ease, I'm gonna bring this SE5 back up this is kind of a, an interesting hybrid serration that you have going on back here. You've essentially, this may not be uh, exactly like uh, the VEF flat top serrations, but they're pretty similar. You can see rather than points, we have some flat sections. And then the serrations are ground in, and if, when you look at the back, you still have the full secondary bevel there on the serrated edge. So you can sharpen these serrations without actually sharpening the serrations in a way. When you go in with your flat stone on each side, you're gonna be removing a little bit of that flat top and eating further into the, uh, the half moon scoop out of the serration itself. And that might be enough, and in many cases will be enough, to keep that serrated edge biting and doing what serrations are good at. Kinda cool. Next question comes from Max the Maker. DCA, I'm looking for a knife to carry with my paramilitary too. Here are the requirements. Under $50, under three inch blade, and a different handle material than my RGT Micarta scaled PM2. Um, so this one I did kind of latch onto. Most of the time, this type of question is, doesn't make it through to the final cut when we, when we shoot these because you left things like so wide open. It's almost like, well, what do you, you know, so many different things could fit this. But something stuck on me on this one. I was thinking, all right, if I had a paramilitary two, if I was carrying a paramilitary two, what would complement that blade? And you know what? I started thinking about what's a cool, small, little Warncliffe style blade. And I tried to go for something a little less obvious, like Cold Steel's uh, mini Tough Light and Tough Light series immediately came to mind. But how about the Boker Jewel? 45 bucks for these, two and a half inch D2 blade with that Warncliffe shape. Three finger grip, can slide it in your fifth pocket if you want that uh, watch pocket on your jeans. Nice little precise utility knife and has a very different kind of character than your paramilitary two might. I don't know, what do you think of this guy? It's really nice, full flat grind on it. Yeah, talking about grinds earlier. Frame locking knife, 
folds up quite nicely. You've got washers in the pivot. So even if you're uh, carrying it in that, uh, that dusty pocket or you're putting it through some heavier, dirtier cuts, pivot's gonna work well. It still pops open quite nicely. Nice precise stuff you can do with the tip as well. What do you think? And what do you folks think out there too? All right, next question comes from Chris Clodfelter. Uh, got a noob question. On several forums I follow, they're all, they are always talking about reprofiling the blade and adjusting the angle of the shoulder. What does this mean and why would someone choose to do this? Wouldn't that affect the life of the blade? Sure, let's go through this uh, bit by bit. Um, on a lot of forums, you're gathering together some of the, the most passionate of a given subject. So you're gonna hear a lot about you know, reprofiling blades. And the reason is what you can do is improve the performance a bit, depending on what you're going for. Because the thinner you go, of course, and remember we talked about the Scandi grind, which has a very technically thin edge, something like 12 degrees per side, give or take. A typical sharpened knife, let's say it's a 20 degree edge. The thinner you go, the more brittle the edge is going to be, but the more efficiently and the more kind of satisfyingly it's going to slice. And lots of folks would like to do this right out of the box to improve the performance and get more out of it right from the get go. The other thing is, after you've sharpened that knife several times at 20 degrees, think of like a, uh, a flat grind here that we're talking about. Well, this, the flat saber grind anyway on the, this SE. The more you sharpen this edge, the thicker that edge is going to get. So after you've sharpened it a few times, if you're noticing a difference, you can thin out the shoulders, either just by removing a bit of the shoulder or going all the way down to the edge at a steeper degree, maybe like 17 or 15 or something like that that'll bring a bit of that performance back. Again, at the sacrifice of some edge stability. But even if you kind of reprofiled this, take, take apart even the, uh, the fact of the edge is gonna get thicker the more you sharpen it. If you're starting with a quarter inch thick blade stock here with not the thinnest edge to begin with, maybe you wanna come in at 15 degrees and thin that out. But when you get right to the edge, when you get it to that, uh, that 15 degree, if you came back at that point and gave it a 20 degree per side bevel, right at the edge, you're gonna get a little more stability back and you're gonna have less shoulder getting in the way when you go to cut. Will this be noticeable? Not to everybody, uh, but the more you cut and the more you kind of analyze how things feel as they cut, definitely can make a difference, however. As to would this affect the life of the blade? Kind of, kind of hinted on that. The edge itself is gonna be a little bit thinner, but you are, you are going further up the blade, but you're not really sharpening, you're not bringing the edge further up the blade. So in terms of longevity, depends on the use, but the actual sharpening part of it, not quite so much. I mean, on, on different terms a little bit anyway. So, hope that helps. Now we come to the lightning round for today. First one is from KnifeGuy2112. Hey DCA, every time I grab a knife to carry, I always open and close it once or twice. It does not matter if it is a fidgety knife or not, I still do it, even a fixed blade. I will unsheath it, then resheath. My wife has called me out on it and I have no quote unquote logical excuse. Can you or any other viewers relate? Yes. Yeah. Next question, Fred the Barber. Yes, 100%. <laughs> Who doesn't do that? <laughs> Uh, Fred the Barber, hey there DCA, I recently purchased a Civivi Conspirator and I love most aspects about it. However, I chose the wooden handle, which I find to be dangerously slippery. Uh, when flipping it open, I've had it fly out of my hands a few times. Any suggestions on ways to customize it to add grip so that my fidgeting doesn't result in injury? Um, maybe slow down on your flip. I mean. This doesn't strike me as a particularly slippery knife handle, like at all, really. What are you doing? Are you like you putting a lot of wrist into it? Because you shouldn't need to. Are you, you button pressing the button and, and wrist flicking it? Eh, maybe hang on to it a little more. But there are some things you can do. Um, if it weren't a wood handle, one of the easy things you can do, I've done this on uh, an old multi-tool that I had, skateboard grip tape can be applied and that's kind of a really aggressive gritty thing. Might not look great on this particular knife, but maybe take a length of hacksaw blade and real lightly you could just score the surface of this, either just straight striations, give yourself a diamond pattern if you want, 
have a little fun with it. Do a little customizing, but I'm curious to wonder to know how this doesn't feel slippery at all to me. Maybe he's got a long term career at the Crisco factory. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Wash your hands then. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Generally, a good um, idea. But, but hope that helps. I, I would, being wood, it's going to be real easy to uh, texture that up in some way. I mean, shoot, actually, easiest way, if you could get some really rough sandpaper and, and just scuff up the, the surface. But some carefully done striations I, or, or diamond uh, checkering done yourself, I think would look pretty cool. Mike Jernak or Jernak says, how many times do you get cut per year? I'm saying an average of five times. Who can say, really? I stopped counting. <laughs> Most of the times when there's a, a band-aid in the uh, close-ups, it's Thomas, it's not me, but uh, I get cut a few times. That happens. Yeah. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Which brings us to our most serious question of the day from Chicken Drumstick. What knife would you choose to slay a fire-breathing dragon? I seem to have gotten a dragon infestation and the exterminator, exterminator says they don't deal with dragons. I mean, I get that. I mean, the liability insurance alone is probably just, you know. I mean, OSHA alone is going to be a headache. <laughs> well, as any good Tolkien fan should know, all you need is the black tipped arrow. There you go. Ontario Bob Dozier arrow folder right there. 65 bucks. Take care of your dragons. No problem. I betcha. Yeah. Yeah. Fantasy nerds. You with me out there? I see you. Anyway, that is all we've got for today. Remember, leave your questions in the comments section below this video and you'll have a chance for it to get picked for a future episode. If you want to check out any of these knives and perhaps purchase one, including that nice big saber right there at the front, there'll be links in the description that take you over to knifecenter.com. Make sure you're signed up for our knife rewards program while you're there, because if you're gonna spend your money on one of these knives or sabers, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera, and we're signing off. See you next time. If you got a dragon problem, don't invest in gold.